Hey everyone, welcome to another deep dive, uh, this time into where psychology and UX design kind of collide. Yeah, it's an exciting area. It really is. We're going to be looking at this book by John Yablonski. It's called Laws of UX. And uh, just even skimming through it, I'm just mm -hmm. like blown away by how much of what we see online is tied to like how our brains actually work. It is. It's remarkable how often we encounter these principles in our everyday digital lives without even realizing it. Yeah, it's totally true. So let's jump right in. Uh, one of the first laws that Yablonski talks about is Jacob's Law. Mm -hmm. And essentially what it says is that people spend most of their time on other sites. Right. So they're going to expect your site to work the same way. Mm -hmm. So like if I'm constantly hitting roadblocks because some website decided to like reinvent the wheel on something as basic as navigation, like yeah. I'm out of there, right? You hit the nail on the head. Think about it this way. You're used to finding the navigation bar at the top of most websites. If a site suddenly places it at the bottom, you're going to feel disoriented and frustrated. And it's not just about aesthetics. Right. It's about tapping into those existing mental models that we all have for how things should work online. Yeah, like that frustration can really kill you when you're trying to buy something. Absolutely. Like yeah. if I have to hunt for the add to cart button, I might just give up altogether. For sure. I know I've done that. Absolutely. <laughs> and that's where leveraging Jacob's Law can have a huge impact on things like conversion rates and user satisfaction. Designers who understand this principle create seamless experiences that feel intuitive because they align with those pre-existing mental models. So it's not about like being trendy or different just for the sake of it. Right. It's about understanding what users expect and like delivering on that in a way that feels natural. Precisely. Yeah. Remember those form elements we talked about earlier? Yeah. Check boxes, radio buttons, drop down menus. They're designed to mimic real world controls for a reason. They tap into our existing understanding of how those controls work reducing the learning curve and making the interaction feel familiar. It's like those car seat controls. Yeah. You know, whether it's like a high-end car or like a really basic model, you know, how to adjust the seat because those controls are pretty much the same. That's a great example. Yeah. And speaking of intuitive design, let's move on to Fitz's Law, which explores the relationship between the size of a target and how easy it is to interact with the money. Have you ever struggled to hit a tiny button on your phone, especially with your thumb? Oh, all the time. Especially like those little X buttons to close those pop-up ads. Yeah. It's like designed to make you miss. Well, that frustration you're feeling has a name. Fitz Law. It states that the time it takes to acquire a target, like clicking a button, is a function of the distance to and size of the target. So those tiny buttons, especially when placed in awkward spots, yeah. create friction and frustration for users. So it's not just me being clumsy with my phone. It's Damn. like actual science. Exactly. <laughs> Good designers take this into account. They make sure buttons and interactive elements are large enough and strategically placed to minimize that effort and frustration. Think about the iPhone's reachability feature. Oh, you mean where you like double tap the home button? Yes. Or I guess the bottom of the screen now? X. And it brings the top of the screen down? That's the one. So you can reach it with one hand. That feature is a direct response to Fitz's law. Ah. It recognizes that our thumbs can only reach so far comfortably, and it adjusts the interface accordingly to improve one-handed usability. I never even thought of it that way. Yeah. But it makes total sense. It does, and that's a great point. Good design benefits everyone, regardless of their physical abilities. Now, let's shift gears and talk about Hicks Law. This one dives into the realm of choices. Okay. And how too many options can actually paralyze users. Oh, I can totally relate to that. Like some websites just throw so many options at yes. you. You just end up staring at the screen completely overwhelmed. It's like decision fatigue. And Hicks Law explains why that happens. It states that the more choices a user is presented with, the longer it takes them to make a decision. This can lead to what's known as cognitive overload, where our brains are simply bombarded with too much information to process effectively. I bet that feeling of being overwhelmed is like a conversion killer, right? Without a doubt. Yeah. Think about those early TV remotes. Oh, yeah. With a million buttons for every imaginable function, they were overwhelming to use. Modern remotes have adopted a more minimalist approach, offering fewer, more strategically organized buttons. It's like they finally realized that we don't need a separate button for every single channel. Exactly. And that's the beauty of Hicks' law applied to design. 
It encourages us to simplify interfaces, break down complex tasks into smaller, more manageable steps, and guide users through the decision-making process without overloading them. So instead of like showing all the filter options on an e-commerce site right away, yeah. you could like hide them behind a button and only show them once the user starts typing. That's a great example. Yeah. And you see that kind of approach all over the web. Google search is a master of this. They keep the initial search bar front and center. Right. Minimizing distractions and focusing your attention on the most important action. And then once you start typing, yes, they like cleverly reveal those filters to help you narrow it down. It's like they're anticipating your needs as you go. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what makes it feel so smooth and effortless. Hmm. You're absolutely right. These laws don't exist in isolation. They work together to create those moments of aha that make us love certain digital experiences. I'm seeing how they're all interconnected, like a chain reaction of good design choices. They are. Mm -mm. Okay, I'm ready for the next one. What's next on our list? Let's tackle Miller's Law, which tackles the fascinating topic of short-term memory. Okay. We've all heard about the magic number seven when it comes to our ability to remember things, right? Yeah, but I have a feeling there's more to it than that. Is it yeah. really as simple as, like, we can only remember seven things at a time? It's a bit more nuanced than that. While our short-term memory does have limitations... Miller's Law is really about how we organize information visually to make it more digestible. Think about it. Phone numbers are easier to remember when chunked into those familiar groups of digits. Mm. It's not that we suddenly have a bigger memory capacity. Right. It's that we've made the information easier to process and recall. Okay, that makes sense. So it's not about like trying to cram everything into seven bullet points or limiting ourselves to seven items in a navigation menu. Right. It's about how we structure information to work with our brains, not against them. Exactly. I'm... And this applies to website layouts as well. Yeah. Have you ever encountered those walls of text online that just make you want to run for the hills? Oh, all the time. Those are prime examples of ignoring Miller's Law. Good designers use headings, white space, visual hierarchy, and other techniques to break down dense content into smaller, more manageable chunks. This not only improves readability, but also helps users absorb and retain information more effectively. So it's about making the content feel less like daunting and more like inviting. Exactly. We'll take a quick breather here and come back to delve into some more of these UX laws. Welcome back. We were just discussing Miller's Law, and now uh, let's explore another fascinating principle. Postel's Law. Okay, this is the one that was originally for like computer networks, right? It was. So how does that apply to UX design? It might seem like a jump, hmm. but the core idea translates beautifully. Postel's Law, it encourages us to be generous in what we accept from users, but strict in what we output. Okay. Think about it. People make mistakes. They might enter information in unexpected formats or use different devices with varying capabilities. So like we should design our systems to be as forgiving as possible when it comes to like user input. Exactly. Imagine if every website crashed just because you accidentally typed a lowercase letter or an uppercase one was required. Oh, I can definitely relate to that. I've like rage quit so many forms because I forgot a hyphen in my phone number or something. And those are the kinds of experiences Postel's Law aims to avoid. It's about building robust systems that can handle those variations in user input gracefully without throwing error messages at the slightest deviation. So it's like having a safety net. Yeah. That catches those little mistakes and like guides you back on track without making you feel stupid. That's a great way to put it. And on the output side, Postal's Law reminds us to be consistent and reliable in what we present to the user. This means ensuring that the interface behaves predictably regardless of the user's device browser or internet connection speed. So it's about designing for inclusivity, making sure that like everyone can access and enjoy the experience no matter what. Exactly. Yeah. You mentioned forms earlier. They're a prime example of where Postal's Law shines. A well-designed form asks for only the essential information and offers flexible input methods like autofill or pre-populated fields. Yeah, those little things can make a big difference. Absolutely. Another concept related to this is progressive enhancement. It's a design approach that ensures everyone gets a working version of the experience, even if they're on an older device or slower connection, while those with more capable setups get additional features or enhancements. So it's like everyone gets the basics, but if you've got the horsepower, you get a little something extra. That's a good way to think about it. Mm. It's about creating a baseline experience that works for everyone and then building upon that foundation to accommodate those who can handle more. I'm seeing how this ties into that whole idea of designing for inclusivity and accessibility that we were talking about earlier. You're absolutely right. 
And now let's shift gears and talk about the peak end rule. This one delves into how our memories of experiences are shaped. Have you ever noticed how you tend to remember the most intense moments of an experience, whether positive or negative, and how it ended? Oh, totally. Like, I might not remember every single detail of a vacation, but I'll definitely remember that incredible sunset we saw or that hilarious thing that happened at the airport. Exactly. And the same applies to digital experiences. The peak end rule states that we judge experiences based on those peak emotional moments, the highs and lows, and how they conclude. So even if an experience has some mediocre parts, a strong peak and a satisfying ending can leave a lasting positive impression. So it's not just about being consistently good the whole time. It's about like strategically crafting those moments of delight or surprise that people will remember. You've got it. Yablonski uses the example of MailChimp's confirmation screens after you send out an email campaign. Instead of just a boring message sent notification, mm -hmm. they use playful animations and humor to turn that moment into a mini celebration. I love those. It's like they're giving you a high five. Exactly. Which can definitely take the edge off that. Did I just send the right version? I thought exactly. And those little touches go a long way in shaping how users feel about the overall experience. Think about those moments of frustration we talked about earlier, like those confusing error messages or those seemingly endless loading screens. Those are the kinds of things that can really sour an experience, even if everything else works perfectly. Yeah, it's like that one bad apple that spoils a whole bunch. That's a good analogy. Yeah. And that's why it's so important to pay attention to those peak moments and endings. All right, what's next? Let's dive into the aesthetic usability effect. This one explores how our perception of beauty influences our judgment of usability. So you're saying that if something looks good, we're more likely to think it works well. You're on the right track. We humans are naturally drawn to beauty. And this bias extends to the digital realm as well. We tend to associate visually appealing designs with positive qualities like trustworthiness, competence, and even intelligence. So it's like judging a book by its cover, but for like apps and websites. Precisely. And while it's true that aesthetics should never overshadow functionality, there's no denying that a well-crafted visual design can create a positive halo effect, making users more forgiving of minor usability hiccups and more likely to stick around and explore. So it's not about sacrificing usability for aesthetics, but rather using those aesthetic elements to enhance the overall experience. That's the key. Think about some of the most iconic designs out there, like those sleek brawn appliances or those minimalist Apple products. Their aesthetic appeal contributes to the reputation for quality and functionality. It's like they're saying, we put so much care into how this looks, you just know it's going to work flawlessly. Exactly. And that perception of quality can translate into increased trust and loyalty from users. But what if something looks amazing but is actually terrible to use? Like, all style and no substance. That's a valid concern. And that's where we need to be cautious. Beauty can mask usability flaws. A website might look stunning, but if the navigation is confusing or the buttons are hard to find, users will quickly become frustrated no matter how pretty it is. Right, so it's like putting lipstick on a pig. That's a bit of a harsh analogy. Okay, maybe. But I see your point. Aesthetics should co complement and enhance usability, not disguise its shortcomings. Got it. So what's next? Let's explore the Von Riesdorf effect, which is all about making things stand out from the crowd. Have you ever noticed how you're more likely to remember something that's different or unusual? Oh, for sure. It's like that one brightly colored house on a street full of beige ones. You just can't miss it. That's the Von Riesdorf effect in action. It states that things that stand out visually are more likely to be remembered. In the UX world, this means using contrast and visual hierarchy to draw attention to important elements or actions. So it's like highlighting the key points in a textbook. That's a great analogy. But just like you wouldn't highlight every single word in a textbook. You don't want to make everything on a screen stand out. Right, because then nothing would stand out. Exactly. The key is to use the Von Restorf effect, strategically highlight those critical actions, like the Add to Cart button or the Submit button on a form. And thinking back to Fitt's Law, you'd want to make sure those buttons are not only visually distinct, yes. but also large enough to easily tap or click on. Absolutely. Yeah. These laws all work together to create a more user-friendly and effective experience. I'm really seeing how all these pieces fit together. Yes. What else do we have? Let's tackle Tesla's Law which is also known as the Law of Conservation of Complexity. It's a bit of a mouthful. Okay. But the concept is fascinating. I'm intrigued. What's the gist? Tesla's Law states that for any given system, there is a certain amount of complexity that is inherent and cannot be reduced. 
The question is, who handles that complexity? The user or the system itself? So it's like deciding who does the dishes. I like that analogy. And someone's got to do it. And in the UX world, the goal is to shift as much of that complexity burden away from the user as possible. Think about those early email clients where you had to manually type in every single recipient's email address. Oh, it sounds awful. It was. But thanks to features like autocomplete, smart replies, and contact lists, the complexity of managing email has been greatly reduced for the user. So it's like those magic elves that come in and clean your house while you sleep. Exactly. And that's the beauty of Tesla's law applied to design. It encourages us to think about how we can make the user's life easier by handling those complex tasks behind the scenes. And Amazon Go stores are like a perfect example of that. Yes. Walk in, grab what you need, and walk out. No checkout, no scanning, pure magic. You nailed it. But behind that seemingly effortless experience is a whole lot of complex technology working hard to make it happen. It's like the wizard behind the curtain. Right. But isn't there a danger of like oversimplifying things? Absolutely. To the point where people don't know what to do. That's a critical point. We have to be careful not to simplify to the point of abstraction. Meaningless icons or overly stripped down interfaces can actually increase cognitive load for users. So it's a balancing act. It is. You want to make things simple, but not too simple. Exactly. And speaking of speed and efficiency, let's move on to the Doherty threshold. Okay, what's that one about? The Doherty threshold highlights the importance of response times in shaping user perception and productivity. So are we talking about like when a website takes forever to load and you just give up and go somewhere else? That's a classic example. Yeah. Research has shown that there's a threshold around 400 milliseconds where response times start to impact our perception of speed and efficiency. Above that, we become distracted, frustrated, and less productive. So it's not just about being patient. Our brains just expect things to happen quickly. Exactly. And good designers understand this. They use techniques like optimistic UI to make things feel faster, even if the processing is still happening in the background. Okay, what's optimistic UI? Think about Instagram's instant comment posting. Even though your comment is still being processed, they show it right away to make the experience feel seamless and instantaneous. So it's like they're saying, don't worry, we got it. Exactly. And those little touches can make a big difference in how users perceive the speed and responsiveness of a system. Another technique is using progress bars and estimated wait times to make those unavoidable delays feel less frustrating. Yeah, it's like knowing how long you have to wait for your food at a restaurant. It's way less annoying when you have some idea. That's a great analogy. It's about managing expectations and making those waits feel more tolerable. This is all making so much sense, but are there ever times when slowing things down might actually be a good thing? That's an excellent question. Yeah. And the answer, surprisingly, is yes. There are certain situations where intentionally slowing things down can actually enhance the user experience. Okay, now I'm really curious. When would you ever want to do that? Think about security checks, for example. Mm -hmm. We inherently trust processes that seem to involve a bit more effort, even if behind the scenes the security scan is happening lightning fast. So it's like good things come to those who wait. Exactly. Sometimes that perception of effort or time invested can increase our trust and confidence in a system. Wow, that's really interesting. It's like we're playing mind games with ourselves. In a way, it is. Yeah. And that's the beauty of understanding these U.S. laws. We can use them to not only create more efficient and usable experiences, but also to shape user perceptions and build trust in our systems. This has been a real eye-opener. I'm seeing the digital world in a whole new light now. Me too. Eh. And we're just scratching the surface here. There's a whole world of UX psychology to explore. I'm ready for more. What other UX laws are out there? Okay, so we've gone through all these UX laws and like I'm excited, but I'm also a little stuck on like how to actually USC this stuff. Yeah, I get it. It's one thing to understand the theory, but how do you actually translate that into better designs? Especially when you're juggling deadlines and client demands. Yeah, exactly. Like how do I actually use this stuff in my day-to-day -day work? Well, one key is to have a solid set of design principles. Yeah. Remember, we touched on that earlier. They act as your guiding stars, helping you make those tough choices and keep the user front and center. So it's not just about memorizing the laws. It's about like having a framework that connects them to my design philosophy. Exactly. And that framework should be directly informed by these UX laws we've been exploring. Okay, so how does that work in practice? Can you give me an example? Sure. Let's revisit that principle of clarity over abundance of choice that we talked about. It's closely linked to Hicks law, which, as we know, is all about minimizing cognitive overload by streamlining choices. Right. Less is more when it comes to our brains. Exactly. 
So once you've established that connection between the principle and the law, you can start to develop specific rules or guidelines that put it into practice. So I might have a rule that says, like, limit choices to no more than three items at a time. That's a great example. Or keep explanations super short. Exactly. You're essentially translating those high-level principles into actionable steps that you and your team can follow consistently. So it's like I'm creating a cheat sheet for good design, mm -hmm. but one that's based on science and not just my own opinions. That's a fantastic way to put it. It takes the guesswork out of those tough design calls and helps you stay focused on what truly matters creating a user-centered experience that's both effective and enjoyable. This deep dive has been amazing. But before we wrap up, I have to go back to that question you asked earlier. What if every app had a cognitive load score? It's a powerful idea, isn't it? Imagine being able to see at a glance how much mental effort an app demands from you. I think I'd choose apps with lower scores for sure. It would be like having a nutritional label for our digital consumption. Right, like cognitive calories. Exactly. And it really underscores how understanding these UX laws can empower us, not just as designers, but as digital citizens. We become more aware of the choices we make and how those choices impact our mental well-being. So we're not just designing better apps, but also choosing better apps for ourselves. Exactly. It's about reclaiming that sense of agency and creating a digital world that works for us, not against us. This has been a fantastic journey. Thanks so much for guiding us through the world of UX psychology. It's been my pleasure. I hope this deep dive has sparked your curiosity and inspired you to explore these concepts further. It definitely has. And for our listeners, if you want to learn more, we highly recommend checking out John Yablonski's book, Laws of UX. It's packed with insights that'll help you become a better designer. And remember, whether you're designing a website, an app, or even just an email, these laws can help you create experiences that are not only beautiful, but also truly user-friendly. Until next time, happy designing, everyone. And remember, with great power comes great responsibility. Let's use what we've learned to shape the digital world for the better. Welcome back, everybody, to another deep dive. You guys know we love digging into all sorts of fascinating topics. And today we're tackling the world of conversion optimization. Now here we have a really great book to guide us on this journey. We do. It's all about helping businesses boost their online sales, which, let's face it, is something we're all interested in, right? Absolutely, though. It's important to remember, it's about more than just flashy designer tricks. Oh, for sure. And we'll definitely get into the specifics. We'll dive deep into how to optimize that entire customer journey. Love it. From the first click to that, you know, glorious purchase complete moment. That's the goal. It is. Okay, so... I get the idea, you know, we want to create a digital storefront that makes people want to click buy now, but like, how did we even get here? I mean, wasn't it enough back in the day to just like have a website? You would think so, but those early days of e-commerce yeah. are kind of like the Wild West. Uh -huh. You know, back in 1996, there were less than 50,000 websites even out there. Wow. Just having a presence online seemed like a golden ticket. Yeah, just being there. So the dot-com bubble burst that illusion pretty quickly. Oh, it was a harsh lesson for a lot of people, that dot-com bubble. It was. So simply existing online wasn't enough to, like, strike gold. <laughs> Not even close. Okay, so businesses realized they needed to attract customers and, and what, convert them into buyers? Exactly. That's when online advertising really started to take off. Yeah, it boomed. But even with increased traffic, mm. those early e-commerce pioneers, you know, they struggled to actually turn those clicks into sales. They did. So lots of window shoppers, not enough actual purchases. Yeah, think of it like this. Okay. It's like you put all this effort into getting people to your store, but once they're there, they just wander around. Right. Not putting anything in their baskets. Yeah, that's frustrating. So the question becomes, how do you bridge that gap? Right, right. How do you get them to actually buy? And to understand the power of conversion optimization, we can actually learn a lot from, well, giants like Walmart. Walmart. Oh, okay, wow. I'm intrigued. I don't immediately connect them to online sales. Well, think about it this way. Walmart doesn't just randomly place products on shelves, right? Right. Every detail is meticulously designed to guide shoppers towards making a purchase. Interesting. From store layout, product placement, to even the checkout line strategies. Oh, so they're masters of subtle manipulation. In a way, yes. Huh, fascinating. Take, for example, their impulse buys near the checkout. Oh, yeah. Online retailers can learn from this by, say, recommending related products during the checkout process. Smart. 
gently nudging customers to increase their order value. Okay, so it's about understanding the psychology of the shopper, both online and offline. Right. But how do we measure the effectiveness of these strategies? You need data. I've heard of uh, KPIs, right? Key performance indicators, is that it? That's it. Are those important? KPIs are crucial. They're like your compass in the world of conversion optimization. Okay. They tell you what's working, what needs adjusting. So more than just tracking website visits. Much real. Okay, like what are some examples of these KPIs that really matter? Well, you want metrics that tie directly to your bottom line. Okay. So for e-commerce, that might be conversion rates, average order value, or even customer acquisition costs, or CAC. CAC, what is that? I haven't heard that one before. That's the average amount you spend to acquire a new customer. Oh. It's crucial because it tells you, you know, if you're actually making a profit. Right. You have to know how much you're spending to bring in each customer. Exactly. To actually make a profit. Yeah. If it costs you $100 to get a customer who only spends $50, that's a problem. Big problem. Yeah. Right. So tracking CAC hack helps you understand the profitability of your marketing efforts. Okay. So we're talking about real people with their own motivations, right? So of course. That's key. Anxieties. How do we factor that in? Well, that's where the power of crafting really detailed customer personas comes in. Okay. We go beyond just basic demographics. So interesting. And we get into their psychology. Okay, now we're yeah. talking. What are their fears? What are their goals, their pain points when they're shopping online? So it's like we're creating character sketches for, for our ideal customer. Exactly. That's cool. By understanding them, you can tailor your website experience to really resonate with them. Right, make it personal. And one way to get into that is by looking at their temperament, their buying style. Their temperament, okay. This book actually lays out a simplified version of the classic four temperaments. Okay, I'm intrigued, break it down for me. Think of it as four distinct personality types. Hmm. The, the impulsive, the aggressive, the caring, and the logical. Hmm. I wonder which one I am. We can figure that out later. Yeah, okay. But let's start with the impulsive shopper. Okay, lay it on me. They thrive on instant gratification, so you need clear benefits, punchy copy, and effortless checkout process. Makes sense. Appeal to that impulsivity. All right. Now, what about, uh, what was it, ag aggressive shoppers? Ah, yes. They want control. They want the best deal possible. Uh -huh. So you need to highlight unique value propositions. Okay. Use social proof. Maybe yeah. a little scarcity to create that urgency. Play to their competitive nature. You got it. Okay, I'm getting this. So we've got the impulsive and the aggressive. What about the other two? What were they again? You have the caring shoppers who are all about connection. Oh. They want to feel good about their purchase, right? Yeah. So emphasize ethical practices. Oh, interesting. Highlight testimonials. Build a sense of belonging on your site. So it's not just about the product itself. No. It's about the values behind it. Exactly. Huh. I like that. And lastly, the logical shopper. They are data-driven, very detail-oriented, oh. given the information they need, mm -hmm. comparisons, expert reviews. So build their confidence. That's the key. Okay, so we've got our ideal customer in mind. Yeah. We've thought about their temperament, mm -hmm. but how do we make sure they trust us enough to actually hand over their credit card info? Ah, uh, that's a critical point. It brings us to the trust equation. The what? The trust equation. Building trust online is a multi-stage process. Okay. And it starts with awareness. So they need to know we exist before they can even consider trusting us. Exactly. People need to know you exist before they can even consider trusting you. That's where marketing comes in, right? Getting the word out. Exactly. Then comes liking. Mm. Your website needs to make a good first impression. Think of it like your digital storefront. Right. Does it feel welcoming, professional? All of that. Does it align with the brand? Absolutely. And that's where confidence comes in. You need to demonstrate clear value. You need to showcase your expertise and provide proof that you are a legitimate business. So things like testimonials, security badges, maybe some press mentions, things like that. Precisely. All of those elements work together to build that final stage of trust, which is earned through consistent positive experiences, delivering on your promises, exceeding expectations. Trust, the holy grail of online business, right? It is. But there are always those nagging doubts, especially when it comes to handing over personal information online. You're talking about those pesky FUDs. FUDs. Years, uncertainties, doubts. Ah, those are definitely real. They can be conversion killers if you leave them unaddressed. So how do we combat them? What are some practical strategies for putting those anxieties at ease? Well, transparency is key. Okay. Make sure those security indicators, you know, those SSL certificates, trust badges, 
They need to be prominent. Oh yeah, I've seen those. Make sure your contact information is easy to find. A clear return policy can go a long way in building confidence. It's all about showing customers that you've got nothing to hide, right? Exactly. And right. never underestimate the power of social proof. Like what? Testimonials, right. reviews, yeah. case studies, all of that. Okay. It shows potential customers that others have had a positive experience. Right. Seeing is believing. Exactly. Okay, but can we get back to testing for a second? No. Because this book really seems to emphasize the importance of experimentation. Testing is crucial. Okay. It's not enough to just assume what will work. Yeah. You need to test your hypotheses and let your visitors tell you what they respond to best. But how do we even know what to test? There's so many variables. Well, you start with a solid testing strategy. Lay it on me. Define clear goals first. Goals, okay. Are you trying to increase signups, boost sales, encourage more engagement with your content? Oh, so you have to have a target in mind. Right. No point shooting arrows in the dark. Exactly. Once you have your goals, then you choose the right metrics to track. Right, the KPIs. Exactly, they help you measure your progress. Okay, so goals and metrics, check. What's next? Then comes the fun part, mm. formulating hypotheses. Hypotheses. Based on your research, your understanding of your target audience, your analysis of your current website, Yeah. what changes do you think are gonna have the biggest impact? So we're making educated guesses about what might actually improve those conversion rates. Exactly. Okay. For example, if you're seeing a high abandonment rate on your checkout page, okay. you might hypothesize that simplifying the form or offering multiple payment options could lead to more completed purchases. So it's a process of constant tweaking, constant refining. Absolutely. Okay. And there are tools that can help you test those hypotheses effectively. Oh, like what? Well, you have A-B testing, which allows you to compare two versions of a page element and see which one performs better. So like testing a green buy now button versus a red one? Exactly. Huh. Yeah, I always wondered about that. And for more complex scenarios. Yeah. You can use multivariate testing to test multiple elements simultaneously. Okay, that sounds a little complicated. It can be, but the insights are incredibly valuable. Mm. You can then make data-driven decisions to optimize your website. So we're constantly learning and adapting based on real data. That's the key. Okay, I like that, but can we can we dive deeper into any specific areas where businesses often struggle? Of course. We talked about the importance of addressing those FUDs. Make sure your website is clearly communicating security measures, contact information, return policy. Transparency and accessibility. Exactly. But poor website usability can also be a major conversion killer. Okay. Is your navigation intuitive? Mm. Is the checkout process seamless, yep. secure? Yeah. Are your calls to action clear, compelling? So it's like creating a smooth and enjoyable shopping experience, but uh, online. Precisely. If your website's difficult to use, people are going to get frustrated and leave without buying anything. It's like that feeling when you walk into a store and you can't find what you're looking for. So frustrating. You got it. Okay. User experience is key. Now let's talk about the power of imagery. Okay, I'm listening. Images can make or break your conversion rates. You want to use visuals that are relevant, high quality, and emotionally resonant. So not just any old stock photo will do. Exactly. Okay. Test different images. See what resonates with your target audience. Right. Remember, a picture is worth a thousand words. Okay, imagery is important. What about the written content on the website? Mm. Is there an ideal length for product descriptions or landing page copy? That's the eternal debate. There's no one size fits all answer. Yeah. It really depends on your product, your audience, your overall strategy. So test, test, test. Always experiment with different lengths, styles, calls to action. Right. Analyze that data. Psst. See what's working. Yeah, yeah. Copywriting, it's an art and a science. It is. So we've talked images, copy, user experience, anything else we should be thinking about when it comes to optimization? This book dies into the concept of segmentation, which can be really powerful when you combine it with testing. Remind me, what is segmentation again? It's about dividing your audience into different groups. Okay. Based on their behavior, demographics, other characteristics. Okay. It allows you to tailor your messaging and your website experience to their specific needs and preferences. So we're personalizing the experience. Exactly. Hmm, I like that. For example, you could segment your audience by their purchase history. Okay. Browsing behavior or even location. And then test different versions of our website on each segment to see what resonates best. Precisely. This allows you to create a more targeted and effective online experience. Imagine offering personalized recommendations yeah. based on past purchases 
or tailoring your messaging to appeal to specific demographics. Okay, segmentation makes sense. It does. But with all this focus on testing and data, it's easy to lose sight of the human element. It's a great point. And remember, conversion optimization isn't about tricking people into buying. Yeah. It's about understanding human behavior, building trust, creating an online experience that is both enjoyable and effective. Right. We want to create loyal customers who yeah. are actually happy with their purchases. Exactly. And that brings us to a crucial point. Conversion optimization is a long-term commitment. Oh, okay. It's not a one-time fix. It's an ongoing process, mm. learning, adapting, constantly improving. So no magic bullet, just consistent effort and a willingness to experiment. You get it. The online world is constantly changing. Yeah, it is. Customer behavior is evolving. You need to stay nimble. Right. Adapt. Adapt your strategies accordingly. It sounds like a fascinating challenge. It is. And the rewards can be significant. I'm feeling inspired. Good. But before we get ahead of ourselves, can we look at a real world example of how these principles have been applied successfully? Absolutely. The book actually has a great case study about YouTube. The book has a great case study about YouTube. And uh, this case study highlights how they optimize their homepage to encourage more users to sign up for accounts. YouTube. Interesting. Yeah, remember back in the early days when YouTube was just a place to watch funny cat videos? Oh, yeah. Hard to imagine it any other way now. Right. Well, back then, a lot of people were just passive viewers. Right. But YouTube knew that getting people to create profiles, upload videos, interact with each other, that would be key to their long-term success. So they were thinking beyond just views. They wanted to cultivate a community. Exactly. And they had some clever hypotheses about how to do it. Like what? Well, they figured that... Clearly, spelling out the benefits of having an account would be persuasive. Benefits like? Things like creating playlists, rating videos, participating in discussions. Right. Basically, all the things that make YouTube so engaging today. Yeah, it seems obvious now. Right. But I bet back then it wasn't so clear cut. You're right. It's easy to take those features for granted now. Yeah. They also hypothesized that making the sign up button more prominent would lead to more clicks. Makes sense. Sometimes it's the simplest things that make the biggest difference. Absolutely. But here's where it gets really interesting. Okay. Because YouTube had so much traffic, they were able to run a massive multivariate test with over a thousand different variations of their homepage. Wow, over a thousand. That's a lot of variations. It is. And because of that huge sample size, they were able to get statistically significant results in just a day or two. That's the power of big data at work. So what did they learn? Did their hypotheses pan out? They did. By highlighting those community-focused benefits and making that sign-up button more prominent, they saw a significant increase in the number of people creating accounts. And I imagine that had a ripple effect throughout the platform, leading to more engagement, more content creation. Yeah. And ultimately, the YouTube we know and love today. Precisely. It's a perfect example of how even small changes when tested and implemented strategically, can have a huge impact on a business. It also highlights the importance of having a long-term vision. They didn't just focus on short-term gains. They thought about how to build a platform that would thrive for years to come. Couldn't agree more. They understood that building a community was essential to their success, and they optimized their platform to foster those connections. Okay, so we've talked about a lot of high-level concepts. Yeah. Personas, testing, building trust. But can we get a little more tactical? Sure. What are some specific actionable takeaways that our listeners can implement right away? Absolutely. One that stands out is the power of offering a money-back guarantee. Interesting. A money-back guarantee. Yeah. It seems a little counterintuitive, like it might actually cost you more money. But think about it from the customer's perspective. Okay. It eliminates risk. It says we're so confident in our product that we're willing to give you your money back if you're not satisfied. I suppose it makes you stand out from the competition. It does. Especially if others aren't offering that same level of assurance. Exactly. You can be a powerful differentiator. Okay, so money back guarantee. Got it. Another simple but often overlooked tactic is making your contact information easy to find. Oh, yeah. You'd think that would be a given. You would. But I've definitely stumbled across websites where it felt like they were hiding their contact info. It happens more often than you think. But having that phone number, email address... Maybe even a physical address readily available. Yeah. It shows transparency. Makes you seem more human, Who's, approachable. Exactly. It says we're a real business with real people who are ready to help. I like it. Any final words of wisdom before we wrap up this deep dive into conversion optimization? Remember that conversion optimization is a journey, 
not a destination. Okay. Be patient, be persistent, and always be testing. Right. Because what works today might not work tomorrow. Exactly. So stay curious, stay adaptable, and keep learning. Great advice. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive. It's been a fascinating exploration of the psychology of online sales and the strategies that can help businesses convert more visitors into loyal customers. Yes. And remember, this is just the beginning. Now it's your turn, listener, to take these insights and put them into action. Good luck and happy converting. Welcome back, everyone. We're diving into neurodesign today. Oh, cool. Yeah, how visuals actually like impact our brains. I know, right? It's like one of those things we don't think about much, right. but it's everywhere. You sent me a bunch of research on this, by the way. So yeah. I'm like super ready to unpack it all. Yeah. We've got um, a lot to cover. For sure. Processing fluency. Oh, uh, yeah. Those, uh, you know, snap judgments, first impressions, mm -hmm. even how designs uh, can go viral. Interesting. So before we even get to like the studies and stuff, okay, how would you explain what neurodesign, even IS at its core? Well, you know, it's basically using brain science, insights from brain science, okay, to create visuals that are more effective. I see. Yeah, like a um, you know, a toolbox almost okay. for understanding how people see and respond to what they see. So it's not just like making things pretty, you're saying? No, no, no. There's a real strategy to it. Mm -hmm. You know, you're leveraging all these principles. Yes. Like, um, like processing fluency. Like okay. Our brains, they just love things that are easy to understand. Right. And then, of course, first impressions, mm. those first few milliseconds, milliseconds shape our whole perception. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a little... Uh, a little scary, right? Yeah, it is kind of terrifying. I mean, my website, yeah. what's it saying about me right now? That's a great question. But it's less about being, uh, you know, scared okay. and more about just being aware uh -huh. of the tools that are out there, of the tools that we can use. Okay. We'll get into some of the um, practical tips later. Cool. But really, neurodesign helps you kind of tailor those visuals, mm -hmm. tap into those unconscious processes that we all have so interesting. that drive our behavior. So you're saying there's a whole science behind like why I click on one thing, Absolutely. not the other, or why I share a certain image yeah. or even buy certain products. Totally. And it goes beyond just websites. Oh, okay. I think product design, presentations, anything visual. Social media. Social media, absolutely. Oh, well. I can benefit from these neurodesign principles. Okay, my mind is officially blown. Okay. So let's dig into some specifics. Okay. You mentioned processing fluency. Mm -hmm. This idea that our brains kind of crave simplicity. Yeah. But doesn't that make design, like, boring? That's a good question. I mean, so sometimes complex stuff is just more interesting, right? Right. But see, that's where it gets really interesting. Okay. It's not that our brains always want the absolute simplest thing. Mm -hmm. It's more about how easily we can, uh, you know, grasp the information. Process it. Process it. Exactly. Right. And sometimes a complex image that follows um, predictable patterns mm -hmm. or uses things that we're already familiar with okay. can actually be more engaging. So like... It's like those optical illusions mm -hmm. where you, you know, you see a hidden image within a pattern. Oh, that's a great example. Yeah. And it's kind of cool because your brain has to work a bit. Exactly. Or like decode it. Uh-huh. And that? there's actually a term for this. Oh, is there? It's called uh, low complexity design. Low complexity. Yeah. Even though it looks complex. Right. But it's built on these regular, um, almost compressible patterns. Interesting. Yeah. And it gives you that like... I don't know, that satisfying feeling <laughs> yeah. of solving a little puzzle. Like you get it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's like finding that that sweet spot mm -hmm. between like simple and complex. Yeah. Where your brain is like both challenged and delighted. I like that. I like that way of putting it. I like that too. And this actually ties into something called the mere exposure effect. Oh, tell me about that. So basically, the more we see something, okay. the more familiar it becomes and the more we tend to like it. Okay. You know, think about uh, company logos yeah. or jingles. Even oh, the repetition just makes them, like, stick in our minds. They're just, they're there. So even if a website, like, is visually kind of complex, mm -hmm. if it uses, you know, consistent elements, familiar layouts, it right. will still feel easy to to navigate. Exactly. Yep. It creates that sense of consistency, oh, okay. which makes the user feel uh, more comfortable, more okay. confident. I get that. Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Good, good. So how about first impressions? Okay. You said those form in milliseconds. 
50 milliseconds to be precise. Wow, that's... Uh, less than a blink of an eye. Less than a blink of an eye. Which means, uh, you know, online, yeah. your visuals are working hard before someone reads anything. Oh, wow. Yeah. So what makes a good first impression, like neuro design wise? Okay. Is it just high quality images? Well, that's definitely part of it. Okay. But it's also about conveying um, personality oh. and emotion. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this concept called the uh, mm -hmm. the expressivity halo. Okay. And basically, people who appear expressive and um, mm -hmm. easy to read are seen as more likable. Gotcha. So think, uh, think genuine smiles, clear body language. Yeah. Even in still images, these things matter. So you're saying my website's... Like hero image mm -hmm. should be less, less posed stock photo, yeah, more or authentic say, human, relatable human. Yeah, like think about it this way. Your visuals. Okay. They should be projecting the feeling that you would want to convey. Mm -hmm. If you were meeting someone in person. Yeah, okay. Would you, uh, would you greet them with a stiff smile? No. Or with warmth and personality? Definitely the second one. Exactly. Okay, point taken. <laughs> I uh, I might need a website personality makeover. It's a good thing to think about. Yeah. But what about social media? Okay. Where, you know, people are just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling yep. through tons of content. Oh, it's even more critical there. Oh, really? Yeah, your visuals have to grab attention instantly, convey the whole gist of your message. Yeah. Because if someone doesn't understand what they're looking at in milliseconds, oh my they're going to keep scrolling. So no more uh, blurry poorly lit photos of my dinner. Think high quality eye catching. Okay, tell a story. Yeah. Make people stop and, and really engage. Gotcha. All those principles of visual clarity, mm -hmm. emotional expressions yeah. still apply. All right, I'm 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 seeing a pattern here. Could be. But let's move beyond just the visual for a second. Okay. What about um, sound, other senses? Yeah. You oh. mentioned multi-sensory design. Right, multi-sensory design. What is that all about? Creating richer experiences, yeah, yeah. incorporating other elements, things that yeah. appeal to more than just our sight. So are we talking like um, music? Could be. Sound effects? Possibly. Textures even? Maybe. But how do you do that with a website? Ah, uh, well, that's the thing. Or like a social media post. You can't literally add those things. Right. But you can use visuals that uh, kind of evoke those experiences. I see. For example, think about warmth, texture, even scent. So like showing um, like a fireplace. That's a good one. To evoke like coziness. Exactly. Or a, um, you know, a textured background to make things more interesting. That's another good one. Yeah. Or even, you know, think about the words you use. Oh, interesting. Like describing the, uh, the crispness of an image. Oh. The smoothness of a design. Yeah. These subtle cues really make a difference. I never thought about that. So it's like yeah. you're painting a more complete picture in someone's mind. It's exact. Even if it's like a flat image. It's all about creating a holistic experience. What? Engaging the viewer on uh, multiple levels. I like that. Yeah. And a big part of that yeah. is understanding that emotional language, I guess, of our senses. Yeah. Speaking mm -hmm. of emotional language, okay. let's talk color. Oh, good one. Um, I know certain colors like evoke specific feelings, uh -huh. but is there like more to it than that? There is. It's a whole science, really. Oh, wow. Color psychology. It right. impacts our perception. Mm hmm our behaviors, everything. Right. And while there are those general associations, you know, yeah. like blue with trust and calmness, mm. red with energy, passion, yeah. but you know, your background, okay. your culture, your personal experiences, they all play a role too. So it's not as simple as saying use blue to make people feel calm. Right. Because someone might have like a bad association with blue. Absolutely. From their past. Yeah. It's about understanding the nuances okay. and how you can use color to create very specific emotional responses I see. from your audience. This is making my head spin yeah. a little bit. But I love <laughs> not. Yeah. But I love how it ties back to like our brains. Uh -huh. How they make sense of, of the world. Yeah. Is there anything else about color that relates to um Multisensory design. Yeah. You mentioned something called synesthesia earlier. Oh, yeah. Synesthesia. Can you explain what that is? Yeah. It's a fascinating phenomenon, really, where stimulating one sense mm -hmm. automatically triggers an experience in another sense. So, like, wait. Yeah. Someone might, like, 
see colors when they hear a sound. Uh, yes. For example, someone might uh, literally see the color blue oh. when they hear a certain note on the piano. Oh, wow. Yeah. And while uh, while not everyone experiences it, right. it really highlights uh, how connected our senses are, how they influence each other. So how does that relate to um, to design? Well, designers can actually tap into these yeah. uh, subconscious sensory associations. Okay. Create visuals that evoke specific feelings. I see experiences. <laughs> so like using a... Um, a color palette yeah. that evokes a certain sound or a texture. Exactly. Even if those things aren't actually there. Precisely. It's about creating that richer, more immersive experience. Well, I like that. Yeah. So we're playing with those subconscious connections. We are. This is seriously blowing my mind. It's a lot to take in. It is. Um, are there any other like tricks, I guess, Trick. that multisensory design uses to um, yeah. engage the viewer, I guess, on a on a deeper level? Well, there's this concept called uh, embodied cognition, okay. which suggests that our physical experiences actually shape uh -huh. our thoughts and feelings. Okay, I'm, I'm following. Yeah. But how does that like translate to visual design? Think about how certain uh, shapes and forms mm. evoke those physical sensations. Okay. So for instance, smooth lines, curved lines, yeah. tend to feel more approachable, yeah. more friendly than, uh, than sharp angular designs. So even though I'm just like looking at the image, right. the shapes can make me feel a certain way. That's the idea. Physically that... almost. Yeah. Which then like colors my whole perception. Exactly. And this applies to uh, everything. Right. Product design, architecture, even web design. Wow. That's... Think about the um, the rounded edges of your smartphone or the feeling you get walking into a, a building with high ceilings. Right. You know, these choices, they're subconsciously influencing how you feel. This is making me look at the world totally differently. Good, I'm glad. I'm going to be noticing, like, all the little details now. It's all around us. Okay, so um, how about we move on to another concept? Okay. You mentioned something about um, directing the eye. Ah, uh, yes. Visual saliency. Oh, wait. How our brains decide what to look at first. In a, uh, in a complex scene. In a complex visual scene. So basically, like, what stands out? Exactly. Like the shiny object. Well, that's part of it, yeah. but it's a bit more uh, more complex than uh -huh. just brightness or color. Yeah. Visual saliency, it involves both bottom-up okay. and top-down processing. Bottom-up is all about how our um, our visual system just mm. automatically responds okay. to uh, basic features like contrast, movement. So my eye is just naturally drawn to yeah. something bright or, or moving. Yeah, even if you're not... Uh, consciously trying to look at it. Oh, interesting. And then there's top-down processing. Okay. Where our prior knowledge, goals, yeah. experiences, they um, all influence where we focus. So, like, if I'm looking for a specific product yeah. on a website, yeah. my brain is going to automatically... It's going to filter out. Filter out anything that doesn't match. Exactly. That's amazing. Yeah. And this is where it gets really interesting for designers. Okay. Because by understanding this, this visual saliency... Mm-hmm. They can uh, they can strategically guide our attention. Oh wow! To certain things. Okay, so it's all very sneaky. Things like um, color contrast, size, placement. Yeah, yeah. Those uh, aren't just uh, random choices. They're tools. They're tools for how we you... take in the information. Uh -huh. Wow. Okay. So designers can yeah. create a, a like a hierarchy, right? Yes, a hierarchy of information. For sure. Yeah. 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 That the most important stuff stands out. Yeah. Guides the viewer's eye. Through the design. Mm-hmm. This is making me feel like I need to redo uh -huh. every website, social media post I've ever made. Did a good exercise. Yeah, it is. Um, are there any tools? Tools. That designers actually use yeah. to yeah. analyze, to like predict visual saliency. There's some really cool software. Oh, cool. It uses these uh, algorithms to analyze images okay. and predict where people will look. So it's like like a heat map. Yeah, kind of like a heat map. Okay. Showing those, uh, you know, hot spots. Yeah, yeah. For visual attention. Exactly. Exactly. And designers can use this uh, yeah. to tweak their designs, mm -hmm. make sure those key elements are in the right spot. This is incredible. So it's like a secret yeah. weapon. Sort of, yeah. For, for making visuals that really grab you. Yeah. But I bet, I bet there's more to it. There is than just like following the software. Yeah. Right. It's important to remember those maps are just predictions. 
They don't account for context. Oh, okay. Or individual preferences. So it's it's a guide, not a not a rule book. I like that. Yeah, a guide, not a rule book. Okay. Good design. It still needs that creativity, the intuition, right? The understanding of who you're who you're designing for. The audience. The audience, exactly. But these tools, course, they're helpful. Provide right. those uh, those yeah, insights I that can it. inform the creative decisions. Exactly. Wow, this has been an amazing um, yeah dive into visual saliency. It's a cool concept. It is. I feel like I'm seeing things with new eyes now. Uh huh. I'm glad. And um, yeah, I can't wait to hear more about how this all comes mm -hmm. together. In things like viral designs, presentations. Yeah, let's explore those next. I'm ready when you are. Okay, let's do it. So designs that capture the internet's attention, you know, the ones that go viral. What makes them spread like wildfire? Is there like a, a magic formula for that? Uh-huh, I wish. Right? <laughs> if there is, I'm all ears. Yeah, if only it were that simple. While there's no guaranteed recipe, viral designs often tap into a few key elements. You know, first, they evoke strong emotions. Think those heartwarming videos or the um, memes that make you laugh out loud. The ones you just, like, have to share. Exactly. They, uh, they trigger this powerful emotional response that just makes us want to connect with others. And, and share that feeling. So it's it's not just the design itself. Yeah. It's the the impact. The impact. Yeah, it has on you. And often that impact is amplified by an element of surprise. Oh. Right. So viral designs, they, they tend to challenge our expectations or present familiar concepts in a new, uh, refreshing way. Like like that dress. Yes. That went viral a few years back. Was it blue and black, white and gold? That's a perfect example. It played with our perception of color. Yeah. It sparked this huge debate online. And everyone was talking about it. Because it grabbed our attention. It was unexpected. Yeah. It made us curious. It made you think. Yeah, we wanted to know the answer and Correct. share yeah. our perspective. So strong emotions. Strong emotions. Surprise. Got it. What else makes a design um, shareable? Okay, well, visual saliency yeah. is, is crucial there, right? It is. Yes. Remember, our brains are always filtering. Yeah. Deciding what to pay attention to. Right. Viral designs. They need to be visually striking, okay. easily understood. At a glance. Yeah, at a glance. Yeah. Think bold colors, clear imagery, a simple message that cuts through the clutter. Especially on social media, where people are just oh, oh absolutely trailing through so much. You need something that's going to stop them in their tracks. Okay, and humor. Oh yeah, is, is a big one. Rob. Humor is huge. Think about all the um all the memes. The memes, yeah. The clever puns. Right, unexpected like twisted positions. Yeah, they're funny. They're relatable and instantly shareable. Yeah, it's like little oh, nuggets yeah. of cultural currency no. <laughs> that we exchange to yeah. connect with each other. Okay, so. Strong emotion, surprise, visual saliency, mm -hmm. humor. What about the um, the social context? Oh, that plays a huge role. Does it? Yeah, social proof is a big factor. Okay. We're more likely to share something uh, if we see other people doing it. Right. Especially people we trust. Yeah, yeah. Or, or admire. Like the bandwagon effect. Exactly, the bandwagon effect. The more people are sharing something, yeah. the more we feel like we need to jump on board. Right, right. Creates that sense of urgency, right. FOMO. Fear of missing out. Or... Fear of missing out. Yeah, yeah. And that social pressure can actually amplify okay. the emotional and visual impact of a design. So it's like a, like a perfect storm. It really is. For going viral. It's a perfect storm for viral spread. So there is a science behind the madness. Okay, there's a method to the madness. There is. It's not just luck. No, there are those principles at play. I'm going to be analyzing all my favorite memes now. Ha ha. Good. I'm going to be like, aha. I see what you did there. There you go. Okay, let's um, let's shift gears a bit. And okay. Talk about something a little more uh, practical. It sounds good. Presentations. All right, presentations. We've all sat through those presentations. Oh yeah. That are just like death by PowerPoint. Ugh, the worst. Endless bullet points, boring visuals. So boring. How can um, how can neurodesign help us create presentations? Good question. That people actually want to like watch okay first and foremost yeah ditch the bullet points really get rid of them all together they overload the audience okay. too much information all at once right is it harder to process and That's remember less is more when it comes to like text on slides less is more absolutely stick to a clear message okay use visuals to support and enhance your words gotcha think high quality images 
interesting graphics mm -hmm. and a consistent design style. Okay. Keep the audience visually engaged. So no more like yeah. cheesy clip art yeah. or, or those generic templates. No, get rid of those. Okay. What about the layout of the slides themselves? Visual hierarchy is crucial there. Okay. You got to guide your audience's attention. Mm -hmm. Use larger font sizes for headlines. Okay. Bold colors for key points. Yeah. Clear visual cues. Right. To direct their gaze. So it's like you're creating a, a visual roadmap. Yes, a road for their wall. eyes to follow. Exactly. Make it easy to to process everything. And instead of just presenting facts and figures, yeah, weave them into a story. Oh. Our brains are wired for narrative. Right. Use your slides to create a compelling story. That's so much more interesting. It is. Than just like listing off data points. And using visuals to evoke emotion. Yeah. Will make it more memorable. Totally. Absolutely. Use images that resonate. Mm -hmm. Connect with them on a deeper level. This is making me rethink. I know. Man. My whole approach to presentations. It's not just about conveying information. It's about creating an experience. It's about creating an experience. Exactly. And when you do that. Yeah. Your message is more likely to... To stick. Stick. Yeah. Ah. Okay, so ditch the bullets. Ditch the bullets. Tell a story. Tell a story. Use visuals strategically. Strategically. Got it. You got... Now, how about we take a little peek behind the curtain? Let's do it. See how um, neurodesign research oh, actually yeah. happens. Okay, yeah. This all sounds very high tech. It can be. Are we talking like brain scans? There's definitely some sophisticated technology involved. Okay. But it's also about understanding, you know, the fundamentals, yeah. human perception. Okay. Cognition. It's, so it's like science? It's a blend of science and psychology. Yeah. Okay. Essentially. Yeah. I can see that. Neurodesign research. It draws on neuroscience, mm -hmm. psychology. Yeah. Computer science design. So multidisciplinary. Very multidisciplinary. And I imagine there are a lot of different ways. There are. To like study the brain's response there to are. visuals? There are. Some of the most common methods include eye tracking, okay. EEG, okay. fMRI, and implicit response testing. Those are some big words. Haha, <laughs> they are. Could you... Uh, break them down. Break them down a little bit. Sure, sure. So eye tracking, it uses these special cameras right. track where people are looking on a screen. Yeah, okay. It tells us... Uh, what's attracting the most attention. Like a heat map? Yeah, kind of like a heat map. We talked about those. Showing those uh, hot spots yeah. for visual attention. Okay. And then there's EEG, EG. which stands for uh, electroencephalography. Yeah. It measures electrical activity in the brain. Use Electrodes placed on the scalp. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it's like... Like listening in on the brain's conversations. In a way, yeah. It can provide insights into okay. attention, memory, emotion. Fascinating. What about fMRI? fMRI stands for functional magnetic resonance imaging. Okay. It's a neuroimaging technique. Right. Measures brain activity, detecting yeah. changes in blood flow. So it's like a map showing like what parts of the brain. Yeah, what parts light up. Light up. In response to different visuals. Wow. And then uh, implicit response testing. This one measures those uh, subconscious associations by tracking how quickly people respond to certain prompts so it's a way to like get at those yeah those non-conscious biases interesting that influence our behavior so researchers are like peering into our brain in a way yeah to see how we react to these visuals it's amazing what technology allows us to do these days it really is yeah and as those technologies advance mm -hmm. we're gonna get like deeper and deeper insights. Even deeper insights. Into this uh, complex relationship between our brains and the visual world. So we're on the cusp of like a whole new era. I think so. Of understanding how visuals uh -huh. impact our thoughts, feelings, actions. Yeah. And that understanding has implications for, for everything, really. Design, marketing, education, healthcare. It's blowing my mind. It's a lot. I know. And I'm sure as we learn more about the brain, yeah. we'll see even more uh, innovative applications of this. Oh, absolutely. The future is, uh, it's wide open. It is. What are like some of the potential frontiers years. That, that you're excited about? One area I'm really excited about is uh, personalized design. Personalized design. Yeah. What, is that, what does that mean? Imagine designs that are tailored to an individual's unique preferences. Okay. Cognitive style, emotional state, even. So like a website that adapts to my mood. Exactly. Yeah. 
or your browsing history or what I've what I've looked at. Yeah, it's about creating visual experiences. Wow. That are optimized for your specific brain. Okay, that sounds both amazing. Yeah. And a little bit creepy. Aha. Uh -huh. I know, right? Like, how is that even possible? Well, it's already starting to happen. Really? But thanks to AI, machine learning, biometrics. Okay. Think about the personalized recommendations you get oh, on oh. streaming services. Right. Or the targeted advertising you see online. Yeah. yeah. Those algorithms are already learning. They are. Our preferences. Yeah. Tailoring our experiences. That's kind of wild. It is. And as the technology gets better, yeah. we'll see even more sophisticated personalization. In like everything. In everything. The products we buy, the environments we're in. This is starting to feel like... Um, like what? Like science fiction. <laughs> it is a bit, isn't it? A little bit. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned um, virtual reality, augmented reality uh, yeah. earlier. I'm curious. Yeah. How, how will neurodesign like shape those experiences. VR and AR, they offer these incredible opportunities for creating realistic, engaging experiences. Yeah. But to really harness that power, okay. we need to understand how our brains respond in these virtual environments. So it's not just about making the graphics like no. technically impressive. It's got to feel real. It's got to feel real. Emotionally engaging, yeah. authentic. Yeah. And by applying these neuro design principles, yeah. designers can like use those visual cues right they can to create that sense of presence evoke yeah. specific emotions even guide the user's attention their behavior imagine like a, a vr game yeah where it's so real uh-huh you completely forget you're wearing a headset <laughs> that's the goal wow or an ar experience that uses uh personalized visuals yeah. to enhance your learning your shopping it's like the possibilities are it's endless. They're endless. No, this no. is taking us into okay, a whole new world of visual storytelling. It is immersive entertainment. But with with any powerful technology, right. there are ethical considerations. Always, right? absolutely. Mm -hmm. As these immersive technologies get more sophisticated, yeah, we need to be mindful of their impact. Oh. Our perceptions, behaviors, our sense of self, even. It's like we're stepping into uncharted territory here. We are. We need to be like cautious the cautious and aware aware we need to have those open and honest conversations mm. about the ethical implications yeah to make sure it's used to enhance human well-being right not exploit our vulnerabilities it makes me think of that movie um ready player one oh yeah where people were so like plugged into uh -huh. this virtual world yeah they kind of like neglected their real lives it's a cautionary tale for sure yeah. we need to find that balance you... the real and the virtual right using these technologies to uh to enhance our lives not escape from them not escape from them exactly that's a good point yeah okay we've we've covered a lot here we have from like the science of how we see things yeah. the power of visuals uh-huh the future of design. I mean, it's a lot. This has been an incredible journey. It has been. W what else is on our neuro design agenda? Okay, let's delve into the world of CGI. Ooh, CGI. And how it's being revolutionized by neuro design principles. I'm ready for my close up. Haha. -ha. All right, let's do it. CGI? Uh, I mean, it's everywhere these days. Yeah, pretty much. Movies, video games, even ads. Uh huh. So, so what's the connection to neuro design? Realism. It's all about realism. Okay. Neurodesign is helping those CGI artists understand, you know, those subtle cues our brains use Good. to know the difference between real and fake images. So it's not just about, like, making the graphics technically perfect? No, not just... It's got to, like, feel believable. Yeah, got to feel believable, yeah. On a, on a deeper level. On a deeper level, exactly. By studying how our brains process all this, mm -hmm. researchers are figuring out the, the key factors that contribute to that. Okay. Lighting is a big one. Lighting. Yeah. Our brains, they're super sensitive okay. to how light interacts with objects. I can see that. And even the slightest inconsistency can make CGI look fake. Like a shadow that's... Yeah, wrong place. Or a reflection that looks weird. A reflection that just doesn't look quite right. Yeah, I've definitely noticed those things, even mm -hmm. if I couldn't, like say why it felt off and then there's texture too texture real objects they have this um this complex interplay of textures cgi artists need to to capture that right to make it feel real think about the bark of a tree yeah. or a like smooth metal object you know right I those, those details matter details yeah. yeah they really do so cgi it's not just about like 
making a pretty picture. No, it's much more than that. It's about understanding like how we see the world. How we perceive the world around us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, And and movement too. Movement, okay. Movement's a big one. Our brains are wired to pick up on Okay. even the slightest um unnatural movement. Okay. So those CGI characters, the objects, they got to move. They got to move in a way that feels natural. That makes sense. If it doesn't, we know <laughs> right and away. Those those early CGI movies. Oh yeah, yeah. Where the, the characters just moved so stiffly. That's a good example. Like robots basically. Yeah, you could tell right away. It wasn't real. It wasn't real. It's come a long way since then though. It really has. Neurodesign research is giving these artists Oh. New tools, new insights yeah. to make those experiences mm -hmm. more realistic, more immersive. This is making me think about... About what? The uncanny valley. Oh, yeah. That that feeling of, like, creepiness mm -hmm. when something looks almost human, yeah. but not quite. But not quite. That's a classic example oh, of our brains picking up on those cues. And as CGI gets, like, better and better... Yeah, as it gets closer. At, at, at replicating us. Oh. Humans. I mean, we're going to have to deal with some oh, yeah. ethical stuff there, right? Yeah. Big ethical considerations. Mm -hmm. Creating virtual beings. That are like. That are indistinguishable from real people. Wow. That's a that's a pretty big question. Yeah, it is. Right, it blurs the lines between reality. reality and simulation. Yeah. It's like, what even is real anymore? It has implications for our sense of self. You know, our relationships, mm -hmm. our understanding of what it means to be human. This is getting deep. It's important to talk about these things now. Yeah. As this technology keeps advancing. Okay, let's uh let's switch gears again. Okay. Talk about video games. Oh yeah. I'm a huge gamer. I am too. So I'm super curious how how neurodesign is used. Well, game designers, they're tapping into our reward systems oh, eh? to keep us engaged, keep us coming back for more. Right. They use this uh, this principle called progressive difficulty. Oh, yeah. Games start out easy. Yeah. Get harder. And harder and harder. And then you're like hooked. You're hooked. Yeah. It's all about those dopamine hits. Right. When you level up. It feels good. It feels good. Yeah. It makes you want to keep playing. And they use... um you know, visual cues too, right? They do. To like direct our attention. Yeah, create that sense of immersion. Okay. Things like color, light, shadow, yeah. to set the mood, the atmosphere, yeah. sound effects to... Uh, yeah, make it more real. To heighten the realism, the excitement. Isn't that those, those little details just like transport you? Yeah, to yeah. another world. <laughs> to another world, yeah. You yeah. feel like you're... Yeah, you're right there. Part of it. Part of the act. Of and games tap into our, like, our social instincts too, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Multiplayer features. Yeah, yeah. Opportunities to collaborate, compete. Right. That sense of connection with other players. Yeah. Huge. It adds another layer. Of engagement. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing how much, like, thought and strategy goes into it. It is. It's fascinating. Yeah. What are, like, what are some future possibilities you see? Possibilities. For neurodesign and gaming. One area I'm particularly excited about is biofeedback in gaming. Biofeedback. Yeah. Okay. Tell me more about that. So it involves using sensors. Okay. Track physiological responses. Like? Heart rate, brain waves, skin conductance. So the game, like, right responds to your emotional state. Yeah. Imagine a horror game that gets harder. Oh, my gosh. When your heart rate goes up. That's terrifying. Or a meditation game that uh, okay. guides you towards relaxation based on your brain waves. So it's like the game's adapting. The game's adapting uh, to you in real time. In real time. It's personalization on a whole other level. That's that's crazy. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. And as that technology gets better, mm. I mean, we'll see even more uh, sophisticated ways to use it. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Creating these experiences that are yeah. tailored to our uh, our responses. Oh, wow. Okay, so we've covered CGI in movies, yep. video games. How about um, the apps we use every day? Ah, oh, good one. Is neurodesign playing a role there too? It's all over app design. It's being used to make those apps mm -hmm. more user-friendly, okay. more engaging, right? and yes, even more persuasive. So those app designers, they're like tapping into our brains. They are. To make us keep swiping and tapping. They're playing to our brain's preferences. Yeah, I knew it. Think about those apps that uh, give you personalized recommendations. Oh, yeah. Based on what you've done before. Right. They know we like familiarity. It's like they're learning our tastes. They are. And serving up what they know we want. Exactly. And I got to admit, it works. It does. I'm way more likely to use an app yeah. if it feels like it gets me. Right. 
And then there's gamification. Gamification, yeah. You know, where they add like points and badges. All those game like elements. Yeah, yeah. Leaderboards, all that stuff. Keep us motivated. Well, keep I, us engaged. I'm such a sucker for that. Uh huh. I am too. I love those little like dopamine hits. Oh yeah. When I when I unlock something. It's a powerful motivator. It is. It is. And and visually. Right. Visually. They use um, you know, clear icons. Yeah. Intuitive navigation. Easy to use, basically. Yeah. Gotta make it feel seamless, enjoyable. Yeah, remove all that friction. Remove the friction, exactly. So you just flow through it. So you just flow through it. What are some uh some future possibilities you see? Possibilities. For neurodesign in apps. I'm really interested in the uh the potential of neurofeedback in apps. Neurofeedback. Yeah. Imagine a uh a meditation app. Yeah. It tracks your brain waves okay. and guides you to relax. So it's like a, a personal coach. It is. It is. It's like a personal coach. Right there in your pocket. Right there in your pocket. And as the tech gets better, yeah. we'll see even more sophisticated applications that can yeah. help us improve our uh, our brains, our cognitive skills. Yeah. Manage stress. Manage stress, improve well-being, all that good stuff. This is incredible. Okay, so CGI, mm -hmm. video games. Yeah. Apps. We've covered a lot. We have. What's what's next on our uh, next on our neuro design adventure? Let's talk about the future of screens. Oh, okay. And how these uh, new display technologies mm. are changing the visual landscape. I'm ready. You ready? To see what the future holds. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. We're moving beyond uh, those traditional rectangular screens. You mm. know, the ones we're so used to. Yeah. We're seeing curved screens, flexible screens. Oh. Transparent screens. That's like sci-fi stuff. It is. It is. Even screens integrated into our clothes. In our clothes. And accessories. Wow. Okay. We, it's pretty wild. How will how will neurodesign play a role in, in that? It's all about understanding how our brains respond to uh, different shape, sizes, resolutions. Right, right. Designers need to create those experiences yeah. that are optimized for our visual system. Okay. Make sure these new displays are uh, comfortable. comfortable to use. Easy to use. Easy to use, yeah, and engaging. Right. So yeah. it's not just about the cool factor. No. It's got to work with our brains. It's got to work with our brains, yeah curved screens for example yeah they can be more immersive okay. because they mimic how we actually see oh interesting and flexible screens they can uh they can what adapt to different shapes okay open up all these new possibilities this is like making me rethink huh everything yeah, i thought i knew about screens yeah the future of display technology it's like breaking free from oh, those yeah. those old formats. We don't need those boxes anymore. We don't. No, not necessarily. Yeah. And as these new formats become, you know, yeah, more common, mm -hmm. we're gonna have to reimagine how we design for them. Right. Right. Imagine interactive displays. Okay. Respond to touch, to gaze, well, even I... holographic projections. It's like we're stepping into a whole new world. We are. It's an exciting time. It is exciting, and I bet these. Uh, these advancements yeah. will change. They will. Pretty much everything. Everything. Entertainment, education, healthcare, you name it. Wow, okay. It's a lot to take in. It is a lot. Right. But as with any powerful technology, All right. we need to cool. be mindful of cool. the, the impact it could have. On our perceptions, our behaviors, yeah. We need to make sure these new screens oh, yeah. enhance our lives. Enhance our lives, yeah. And not distract us from, from, from the real world. That's the key. It's a balancing act. It is. It is. Embracing between. innovation while maintaining a uh, a healthy relationship. Yeah, with technology. With technology. Exactly. Okay, so we've explored the science of neurodesign. We have. The practical applications. We have. The future. I mean. It's been quite a journey. It has been a journey. Is there is there anything else? Anything else. We need to, to touch on. Let's talk about a concept that's uh, closely related to neurodesign. Oh, it's yeah. called the constructal law. The constructal. Yeah. Okay, I'm I'm intrigued. Tell me more. All right. So the constructal law, it's a it's a principle of physics okay. that essentially says systems evolve towards towards greater efficiency, ease of flow. Okay. Think about um the branching patterns of trees mm -hmm. or the uh the way rivers meander, Black. those natural forms, they've evolved over time to I... optimize flow oh. of nutrients, of water, of energy. So nature has like its own design principles. It does. It does. And this principle, it applies to um, to design as well. Really? Good design should facilitate flow, too. Oh, 
information, right. energy, even people. In a way that feels like natural. Natural, yes. Effortless. Effortless. Well-designed cities. Okay. Products, digital interfaces, they all share this principle. So it's not just about, like, aesthetics. No, it's about creating systems that uh, so work work with the laws of nature. Yeah, this is this is making me see the world differently. I'm glad. Like there's this this hidden language of design. There is in everything. In everything. It's kind of humbling. It is. And inspiring at the same time. I agree. As we learn more about these paddings, yeah. these principles, we can make designs that are more functional, yeah. more beautiful, sustainable, sustainable in harmony with the natural world. Wow, this. This deep dive has been... It has been a lot. It's been incredible. We've explored the brain, mm -hmm. the power of visuals, the future of design. Yeah, we've covered a lot of ground. I feel like I've I've gained a whole new understanding of, mm -hmm. of what? Of how design shapes our experiences, you know? Yeah. Influences our perceptions. It's a powerful tool. It is powerful. And this is just the beginning, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. This field is... Uh, it's constantly evolving. It's exciting. It's exciting. Yeah. I can't wait to see what the future holds. I'm with you there. This this conversation has like sparked so many ideas. That's great. In my mind. I'm glad. I can't wait to to start applying all this. Yeah. The power to shape the future is in your hands. That's a good way to put it. Use it wisely. Use it creatively. Make the world a... Uh, a better place. A better place, a more beautiful place, a more engaging place, a more meaningful place. That's that's a perfect note to end on. I think so, too. Thank you so much for um, sharing your insights. It was my pleasure. With me today. It really was. I feel like I've uh, I've leveled up my design knowledge. Aha. Uh -huh. I'm glad to hear it. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us on this. <laughs> Deep dive into the fascinating world. Yeah, fascinating. Of neurodesign. It is a fascinating world. Until next time. Until next time. Keep exploring. Keep learning. Keep exploring. And keep designing. Keep designing.